Okay, John, uh, thank you very much. Can I just so interrogate some of the points that you made uh, there? So if we were looking for the equivalent of beverages, five great evils, you're sort of saying that it's probably social care, it's certainly climate change, it's inequality, which has been exposed. And then you mentioned some of the pension generational issues. Um, is that the way people should think about them as evils on which there is now no debate? It's only a question of how or what mechanism. And secondly, um, if you think back of, to things like the Dill Not Report or the Paris Accord, is there enough tenure thinking already out there for uh, the Prime Minister to be able to take really strong initiatives in the second half of this year, which thinking about Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, you know, they must be thinking about a complete reboot of their agenda sometime when the cloud of the pandemic's lifted. So what do you think those can be seen as five evils? And uh, do you think there's been enough thinking to make, for instance, COP26 work in Glasgow this November, or will it be a shambles? So the, the full beverage quote is five giants uh, obstructing the, the road to recovery, so the road to reconstruction. So he clearly was thinking in a similar way to us, that it's what are the obstacles to, re, to rebuilding reconstruction? Uh, I think I'd add, you know, I didn't touch on it in what I said, but I'd add mental health uh, to, to, to the list. I think mental health has, all, has, mental health has become prominent in, the, in public agendas, and political agendas, but it's not yet had a kind of symbolic or organizational form. It's been a thing you have to talk about, but not a thing for which there is um, an organizational form uh, to take to take it take it to, to the next level. Do I think there's enough thinking around? Well, COP26 is a very good example. Um, President Biden, President Xi, and the European Union are all going to come to Glasgow with plans to more rapidly reduce carbon. Um, so if China, America, and the European Union are in one place, then all that the Prime Minister has to do is wrap it up nicely and make sure the communique draws on the, the energy they have and make sure that the management of COP26 brings the smaller countries uh, in its wake, particularly uh, those, co those countries will never become, never for a very long time become carbon neutral, the oil producers, uh, whether they're Venezuela or the UAE. So I think on some agendas, it's very clear, you can see, um, it's, uh, as Ronald Reagan used to say um, about some policy issues, um, it's not easy, but it is simple. Um, so we have, we have some issues which are simple to describe what the solution is. I think it's um, uh, quite often that when prime ministers meet with each other, um, they say, we know what to do, the problem is the voters um, and their fear of the voters they need to overcome. And that's why these big moments, movements like COP26, um, the popular support becomes something you can, you, can, you can hold on to in the same with the way that the, uh, the pressure from NGOs and, and some consumers has pushed them on the, on the, on the okay. supply chain thing. Can I just ask you? I think in other areas, there, is, there, there is thinking around that you could draw on. The one, the one um, question I would pose is, when you turn into to June, some ministers are going to be thinking about the um, the, the judicial inquiry into the handling of the pandemic. Yep. That yep. is going to start to loom large. And you can see with Priti Patel making clear that she argued for an earlier closure, cl lockdown, closure of borders, that she's preparing herself for where she's going to be when the inquiry starts. Yep. Now, you mentioned uh, municipalisation as an organising principle. So for years, there was an argument in the Labour Party about elected mayors and uh, there were tentative steps forward. And then suddenly, George Osborne moved quickly um, with incentives. He, didn't, he wasn't particularly worried about there being a tidy map, um, but he wanted local government units of a size to which you could really devolve and could be big enough to the tasks. There are proposals on the stocks from the Conservatives to do the kind of rationalisation and creating councils big enough to deliver that Michael Heseltine would have talked about years ago. 
um, is that municipalization, localization, not to local government in quite the form we've known it. That does seem to me to be one of the organizing principles that is going to be pushed through. And already in the second phase, we're seeing the homelessness issue that you mentioned pass straight back to local government. And some of that devolution might be a bit cynical, but some of it is driven by a belief that uh, that, that could be an organizing principle that could help uh, regions and cities. What's your view on that? So I think that devolution clearly creates new identities or it turbocharges existing ones. So London's always had an identity, but the mayor of London definitely helps with the notion of London. Um, Scotland's always had a difference from, uh, from England and differences within itself, but the Scottish Parliament has definitely created a different kind of Scottish identity. And you've seen that in the pandemic that Andy Burnham doesn't really have any powers uh, over health provision or even public health uh, in, the, in Greater Manchester, but he sure has had a voice because he, he's, he controls a media market in his own area and from that media market, he can speak to the UK and speak to the UK government. So that generation of a, uh, that generation of new voices, new identities, new leadership, that I think is unstoppable. Uh, I think the current situation is in some sense ridiculous because uh, we have a we we have a patchwork uh, of very different accountabilities for leadership and uh, and powers from for, for leaders. I'm very taken by the kind of reforms that the Centre for Cities have proposed, which is essentially um, local government uh, units which are based on travel to work areas. Now, that may be old fashioned because how often are we going to travel to work in the future? But it gives you a sense of an economic unit and economic units are based on travel. And outside London, that travel is mainly in, in cars. Um, so it's the road network, um, which, which the whole other conversation about uh, electrifying um, the entire fleet of the, of the, of the country. But I, I think what there's a definite case for is a, a reform of English local government around spatial planning and economic units and travel units that make sense, giving power, devolution of powers to the leadership of those um, and I think it, after after these May elections, we'll like to see Tracy Brabin in, um, elected in West Yorkshire. So thankfully, there'll be a woman uh, who's a mayor of one of the major metropolitan areas because one of the things that's been replicated in this piecemeal uh, patchwork um, reorganisation of government has been uh, it's been male leader after male leader after male leader. Um, so I think that there, there's something very vital and, and and possible there. And the city the city region economies are probably the right size for that, but you need to think about a balancing item for neighborhood community expression because we've seen, haven't we, during the pandemic so much uh, expressed from you know, community solidarity, neighborhood uh, organizations sprung up. Okay. Um, now to go down to a, a micro level, I mean, you mentioned uh, the inequality agenda and we talk about um, climate change and the sort of sensitivity and really up until uh, a year or two ago, uh, corporations and managers could rely on uh, their HR directors and their lawyers to provide them with a trustee shield. And uh, there was a lot of cynical comment about what companies were doing about climate change, what was happening about gender pay, uh, a re gender representation and equality. That has clearly changed. And I mean, you and I have spoken about the sort of forgotten manifesto, which was the Conservatives' 2015 manifesto, where there was quite a significant, as you described it, generational shift uh, amongst the rising Amber Rudds and Theresa Mays and Camerons shaking off the old Thatcherite prejudices or, uh, you know, company law first approach. And then that exploded around gender pay and it's exploded on inequality. For managers working over the next decade, uh, everything from checking your carbon footprint to uh, your recruitment and equality policies, and also you know the mental well-being and how you treat your staff, that is going to be a challenge that's significantly different. 
Um, how do you think those things will manifest themselves? Can you legislate for them? Well, in a way, um, there's a push may pull you between legislation and organizational form and organizational leadership. Um, so I would say that, you know, we business was more across the Me Too issues outside the film industry um, and was, was there, were, there were things, there were, there were business, business leaders are held to a higher standard of behavior inside their organizations than politicians probably are held to in their workplace, uh, the House of Commons. Um, so there's some ways in which business is actually ahead in terms of its behavior. And I think there's no, you and I both worked in politics, um, there is no way that the behavior of some political bosses will be tolerated in any organization, any private sector organization in the UK, probably almost every public sector organization too. Um, so there's a way in which um, it's difficult for politicians to lead on some of the issues around the workplace um, because they're, you know, they, they, they are, they're less able to meet the standards they want to other people to, to, yeah. to, 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 to stand up to. But I think that the, the, con the continued force uh, for equalities in its broadest sense within workforces, that will continue uh, as a thing. And I think it's one where, you know, the best companies can lead by example, which will then lead to legislation on the backing on the on the back of what the com the, com the companies have done. The best organisations can live in the form that they'd like to see other organisations living. Nothing's holding people back, and all of the evidence around from you know the evidence around the economic value of that to you, in the bottom line is very very clear. Mm. I think the it it is I I I did some work for. Um, the UN around the UN sustainable, uh, the SDG sustainable development goals. And I, interv I interviewed a host of CEOs um, in companies who'd adopted the SDGs and asked them what was the difficulty adopting them and what was the, the really important thing for adopting them. Because so, we're trying to work out how to sell the SDGs wider and wider to more CEOs. And the most interesting thing one CEO said to me was, the thing is, there was, there was a time when your, your internal culture of diversity was really important, not just for you, but because some of the best and some of the best staff wouldn't work for you unless you were committed to diversity, unless you actually lived that inside your organization. Uh, and the CEO said to me, it's not like that with the SDGs. There are people who will not work for a company that's not working towards the SDGs. Why would they? They've got a choice of where they work, the best people. And, and then he we need those people to work for our company because they're just the leading edge because after potential employees come consumers and you don't want really to get caught in a world where consumers go, you are not respecting the new standards we expect of everybody. So I think in that sense, there's, a, some, there's something quite interesting going on. Okay. Um, very interesting questions about values, which we'll come on to now. So.